During the course of the Second World War, the U.S. Army Air Force produced several successful fighter aircraft that had become legends. The P-47 Thunderbolt, P-38 Lightning, and the P-51 Mustang stand out. Yet none of these famous planes ever achieved anything like the kill ratio of the solidly built, almost rotund aircraft that went by the name of the F-6F Hellcat. The model was developed almost as an afterthought and rushed into production by its manufacturer, Grumman. It was to average 19 enemy aircraft down for every one of its kind lost in combat. On these figures alone, the Hellcat must be judged one of the significant success stories of World War II aviation. It was, in addition, extremely effective as a battlefield and maritime attack bomber. Its all-around performance was a bonus to the war effort of immeasurable value. In 1942, when the Hellcat first went into service, the total concept behind the aircraft was little more than a year old. Within the span of three years, no less than 12,000 examples had been produced, all from the same factory, an engineering achievement in itself. This becomes even more impressive when considered in conjunction with the fact that it was only the second monoplane fighter that Grumman had produced, and was only the third monoplane to be accepted for Navy use. The Army Air Corps, on the other hand, had considerable experience with monoplane fighter designs, going back to the early 1930s. By 1932, the Air Corps had in service the stout little single-wing Boeing P-26, nicknamed the Pea Shooter. In January 1935, Grumman sold the Navy a stubby fighter plane, the XF-2F. And since the delivery of the first one, Grumman has had fighter types under contract for the Navy without interruption. Their next plane was the F-3F, which ironed out some of the vices of the F-2F with more maneuverability and better directional stability. It was adopted by the Navy in relatively large numbers. These were the last biplane fighters produced in the U.S. The drag problems of the strut bracing of biplane wings so hampered speed that it was evident that they would be replaced by monoplanes, despite the twin problems for the Navy of the higher landing speeds of the single-wing fighters and the problem of stowage of their larger shapes within the confines of the fighting ships. The biplane had its inherent advantages of maneuverability, slower landing and takeoff speeds, and the sturdiness of their bracing. However, these factors were irrelevant in the face of the speed advantage of the modern monoplanes, and the era of the biplane was well over by the time the war broke out. By the late 1930s, even U.S. bombers had long been monoplane. 
whose sleek designs gave them greater speed than the Navy's biplane fighters. The Navy had to turn its attention to solving the problems in carrier use of monowing fighters, and tests were conducted employing examples of all Army fighters then in production with pretty disappointing results. It was a case of building new planes for practical carrier deployment. Stripped of one wing, but otherwise not radically altered, the F-3F emerged as the XF-4F in 1936, but it offered little improvement on the biplane's performance and was abandoned and replaced with a new design, the XF-4F-2. The new shape was quickly refined in response to strong interest not only from the United States Navy, but from the British and French fleets as well. During 1939, a new variant, the F-4F-3, was settled and contracts were signed with all three navies, though none of the French planes had been delivered by the time Hitler's Blitzkrieg had knocked that nation out of the combat. Named the wild problems of stowage and movement of the planes around the carriers, a folding wing. Cranked back alongside the fuselage, this novel solution reduced the aircraft's demand for space, although some of the early export models had fixed wings. The stout shape was extremely clever. In spite of its stubbiness, it was aerodynamically very efficient. Defying the trend to inline engines that European designs had led, Grumman stuck with the radio power plant, valuing the extra resilience they offered and their lower demand for maintenance hours, easing the burden on carrier crews operating at sea. Though outmoded in its original role, the plane stayed in production with little refinement right through to the end of World War II. General Motors produced the Wildcat in the thousands for supply to the U.S. and British navies. By the end of 1939, the war clouds over Europe had broken, unleashing a storm of destruction as German forces overran Poland and France behind the stunning assault of the Luftwaffe's air power. The British Navy's F-4Fs, under their designation the Martlet, were actually credited with the first kill of World War II by a U.S.-built airplane when two British-flown Martlets identified and intercepted a Junkers 88 medium bomber over the United Kingdom. Though the 88 was a fast plane for its type, it was no match for the stout little Grumman planes, and it was quickly dispatched. The fleet air arm normally flew its martlets from aircraft carriers in the role they had been designed for as the war progressed and the Royal Navy found itself involved in the vicious attrition of the Atlantic campaign. Trying to protect the convoys and keep the sea lanes open, the F-4Fs were employed in that cold and bleak environment. They provided invaluable service, often working from small carriers with very limited flight decks an ability that ensured their continued service in the years to come. Back in Bethpage, Grumman was well aware that the Wildcat was limited and that the Navy would need a larger, more powerful fighter. Leroy Grumman, the company's president and chief engineer, had been involved in discussion with the Navy to determine their longer-term need for a more advanced plane. Within the Grumman philosophy, build it strong and build it simple, the engineers hammered out a new design to improve on the Wildcat. To provide any marked improvement resulted in a completely new plane being developed. The Navy flyers of the Wildcat were clear on what they wanted, more speed. To provide this meant the use of a more powerful engine, and this meant that the entire structure had to be strengthened. The new plane would be 3,000 pounds, or over 60% heavier than the Wildcat. The previous undercarriage would have been totally inadequate, and in designing a totally new system, the engineers also repositioned it beneath the wings, creating a wider track and making the plane more forgiving in carrier landings. It was Japanese carrier forces that would bring America into the war. <laughs> 
When the Japanese task force attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, they destroyed an important part of the United States naval strength in the Pacific. But the American carrier force was not in port at the time and was preserved. In the subsequent battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, these ships were critical since the outcome of those battles effectively closed the phase of Japanese expansion. During both of these campaigns, the only fighter aircraft available to the U.S. Navy was the F-4F, and although they gave valuable service, they were hard-pressed. The Wildcat was the slowest of all U.S. wartime fighters, yet they were fairly successful. Their generous wing loading gave them better maneuverability and climb rate than some of their faster contemporaries, and with a pragmatic reliance on well-conceived tactics, they more than held their own against the Japanese carrier planes in the battles. The ferocity of the naval aerial war against Japanese opponents who fought with tenacity and bravery is now legend. The Wildcats' hard-fought victories against the Japanese Zeros were a major credit to them. The Mitsubishi Zero was another legend of World War II. Extremely light at the expense of armor plating, it had been designed with three criteria. Most importance had been given to maneuverability, followed by long range and the requirement that the plane have a speed that was at least competitive with other nations' fighters. Though it could best any Allied plane in a dogfight, its very simplicity and lightness made it vulnerable to an enemy who refused to play to its strengths. It lacked a heavy punch with its guns and the ruggedness to absorb hits itself. Because of its competitive edge, special tactics were employed against it to allow the Wildcat to cope. But clearly a faster, more heavily armed aircraft was needed to subdue the Zeros once and for all. Such a plane was already on the drawing board, the Chance Vault F4U Corsair. This powerful fighter with its distinctive gull wing had been under development for some time and was intended for use on the new Essex-class carriers, which were big enough to provide large fighters with sufficient runway to take off and land. But with the U.S. in the war and with the Corsair still needing refinement, the Navy had to look for another alternative to provide the more powerful fighter that was needed to replace the Wildcat. Meanwhile, Grumman's new concept was gathering momentum designated the XF-6F, the top secret project was being presented to the Navy as an aircraft that could go into production very quickly once the go-ahead had been given. Though conventional and strongly resembling the Wildcat, it was a totally new plane down to the last nut and bolt but it still reflected the principle of keeping things strong and simple. The Navy placed its first order on June 30th, 1941, and the plane, given the name Hellcat, went into production. All manufacture of the Wildcat and much of that of the new Grumman Avenger dive bomber was transferred to General Motors, and Grumman turned their whole Bethpage plant to the Hellcat. The first flight took place less than 12 months after the order was placed on June 26, 1942, and production planes were being completed only five months after that. 
that the Hellcat shared with its smaller stablemate, the F4F, was its folding wings, as the innovation had proved itself a real success, and there was no point in changing it. A sturdy strut undercarriage, totally new on a Grumman plane, had been adopted to deal with the heavy load of the new fighter. The great bulk of the stubby design was to be propelled by the 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp engine. Both the engine and the undercarriage were only slightly modified as the plane evolved. You can get some idea of the size of the aircraft as crew climb aboard it. Its bulk would demand too much for the small escort carriers, so these would remain the domain of the Wildcat with its short takeoff requirements. As the designers and engineers refined and perfected the design, the prototypes were virtually hand-built by the company's most skilled tradesmen. Here, ground crew tapped the wing with a mallet to see if any hand tools had been left inside during the wing's construction. After it was sealed, a wrench caught between gears or pulleys could destroy the entire project before it got off the ground. Using the same cartridge-like starter of earlier Grumman aircraft, the F-6F is being readied for ignition. With the successful firing of the engine, the pilot directs the ground crew to remove the chocks, and the Hellcat is ready to take off. In some ways, the success of the Hellcat is a model of the cooperative effort by the Defense Forces and American industry to meet the demands of war. The nation had found itself plunged into the war with little overt preparation. In fighter aircraft, there were insufficient numbers of mostly outdated designs, and yet in a short time, the U.S. was turning out planes that could not only do the jobs given them, but do them very well. In addition, they were being produced in numbers that were well beyond the capacity of the Axis powers. What the U.S. Navy needed and what the F-6F provided was a plane that made optimum use of established and proven technology and that could be delivered quickly in large numbers. The engineering might of North American industry was brought to bear as a potent military advantage for the Allies. While Nazi designers were working with new, still largely theoretical technology in developing jet and rocket-powered planes to regain their previous advantage, their existing arsenal was confronted by overwhelming numbers of excellent conventional aircraft. The Germans' new technology would arrive too late and in insufficient quantity to swing the combat around. The Hellcat, typical of most U.S. fighters, was much heavier than its opponents, but offered comparable or better performance in conjunction with more firepower and greater armor protection for its pilots. 
These planes were more likely to return to base after sustaining damage, so the attrition in U.S. pilots was far lower than their opponents. The U.S. pilots, well-trained and flying better planes, survived their early combat exposure to become experienced warriors. But the Japanese forces, flying planes that relied on flight rather than protection, quickly lost their core of battle-skilled veterans. After the first two years of the wider conflict in the Pacific and Asia, Japanese planes were being flown into battle by pilots who were not only inexperienced in combat, but virtually untrained. Rushed into production to cover the delays in the Corsair project, the Hellcat impressed the Navy. With the expanding need for planes, it was easy to convince the Navy to purchase the Hellcat in large numbers. The nation went to war in the armaments factory as it did on the battlefield. Eventually, the availability of the instruments of destruction would be the deciding factor in the outcome of the war. Here, Grumman made a major contribution. Not only did it deliver a plane that could be quickly deployed to do the job, but it delivered the machinery to make them. The workforce, the techniques and skills needed were assembled and trained to produce the aircraft in phenomenal numbers. Women workers, young and old, joined the workforce, and even the disabled found places in the mobilization of industry to meet the war's demand. The massive 2800 double wasp engines are fitted and the propellers with their complicated gear mechanisms are assembled. The major sub-assemblies prepared in their own sections of the plant are brought together in the final assembly area to make up the plane. When the green light was given, the Hellcats proliferated with astounding rapidity. Never before or since has the aviation industry seen so many of any type of aircraft sourced from one single plant anywhere in the world. Yet within three short years of the delivery of the first Hellcat, the production line had ceased to be. During the Hellcat's entire production run, over 12,000 aircraft were manufactured. Remarkably, in that figure, there were only two major subtypes, and these were so close externally that it's hard to pick the difference. The Model 3 can be identified by the extra window behind the cockpit, which was deleted as being of little value. The F6F5 was given more power through water injection for the engine, and also had various other, mostly minor changes made, notably bomb mounts under the wings, 
For the most part, the airframe remained unchanged, and this obviously was one of the factors that made possible the tremendous output from the Bethpage plant in such a short time. But the most important reason for this was the superb organization of the factory, a model of quality mass production. Over the production life of the Hellcat, even the paintwork varied only once, in changing from the three-tone blue early camouflage to the overall dark navy blue, almost a gloss black, which remained in use till well after the war. Here, a finished Hellcat leaves the paint shop, fully inspected by Grumman's ground personnel. Next, it must go through hands-on testing by the Grumman test pilots. Their job was to look for faults from construction failures, an inherently risky business, before planes were cleared for delivery. In this dangerous job worked some of the unsung heroes of the war, and it is of interest to note that several of these pilots were women. The work of the female ferry pilots in the U.S. flying planes from the factories to bases is better known. But these company pilots, flight testing Hellcats, like the women on the factory floor building the planes or those in the control tower, made a major contribution to the war effort. And their particular courage and dedication deserves note. In this case, the product of their labor, the F6F, was, as far as the Pacific Theater was concerned, the key to victory. Daily, the ferry pilots would come to collect the planes as they were cleared for delivery. The Hellcats rolled from the factory in a constant flow. This mammoth industrial activity, reflected in hundreds of other plants around the country, was to create the situation where, by war's end, the United States' industrial output had soared to be larger than that of all the other combatants combined. Few Hellcats operated from land bases in the Pacific. Most, like the Wildcats, were deployed to carriers. Navy and Marine F6Fs crewed the larger carriers like the Essex class as rapidly as they could be produced. of rolling from the factory, the Hellcats would be employed thousands of miles away at sea, doing what they were designed for, waging war. <laughs> 
The limitations of carrier space dictate a need for Navy planes to be capable of varied missions, since accommodating specific types for different roles is obviously inefficient. So where a tactical attack capacity may be desired for the Army, it is essential in a naval fighter. The Hellcat had air-to-surface capability included from the start, and with its high rate of dive, it excelled in ground attack duties. The Pacific Fleet was subject to daring aerial attack from Japanese Army and Navy planes throughout the war, from the ferocious, even contests of the early battles to the later one-sided affairs culminating in the kamikaze attacks. With the Japanese shortages of pilots and fuel, the suicide attacks saw the aviator devalued to become simply another disposable component in planes that were guided flying bombs. They left base with enough fuel for a one-way flight only, with one aim, to sink an aircraft carrier. Increasingly, as the war progressed, the carriers had become the most important targets. It had been the fact that the U.S. carriers had been spared at Pearl Harbor that had stopped the Japanese advance, and it was the Japanese carrier losses from midway on, losses that Japan could not make good, that were to decide the issue. There was no greater prize for attacking pilots on either side than the enemy's carriers, and to the Japanese, there was no price too high to pay. <laughs> 
The fanaticism of the Japanese pilots was difficult to confront or contain, and so were some of their aircraft. Japan's deadly tool, the Zero, had reigned supreme in the early part of the war, and in fact, none of the Allies ever really had a plane in service that could outfly it. The next generation of Grumman planes, the Bearcat, possibly would have been able to match the Zero in a dogfight, but it was not deployed before the war's end. The Japanese plane's aerial gymnastic ability could be neutralized, and the issue was decided by Hellcats flying in pairs using their higher speed and better firepower to overpower the Mitsubishi fighters. A quick high-speed pass allowed the U.S. pilots to target the lightly built Zero, and the Hellcat could then use its power to break away and return for a second pass rather than trying to mix it up with its nimble foe. The Zero's sacrifice of weight in armor and in rigidity made it a fragile target, and the American plane's heavy guns did not need to make too many strikes on one before it came apart. The Japanese lost their planes to the U.S. tactics, and the Japanese pilots, with their combat experience stretching back to the early 30s, were lost with them. Increasingly experienced, with no shortage of planes or fuel, the Americans faced resistance that was decreasingly effective. The outcome was inevitable. By 1945, U.S. carriers, now flying Corsairs as well as Hellcats, surrounded the Japanese islands. Had it not been for the atomic blasts, doubtless the Navy's air power and LeMay's long-range bombers would have prepared the way for invasion. The Grumman fighters, the F-4F and F-6F, held the line against the Japanese onslaught at the beginning of the war, and alone they fought the war's crucial naval battles. Even when the more advanced Corsair was available, the Cats continued to play a major part. Time after time, the sturdiness of their design and construction brought back from missions pilots who would have been lost in many other aircraft. Certainly, the U.S. fighters survived damage that would have downed their Japanese opponents. The survival of U.S. pilots till they became experienced in combat was very important. The first production Hellcat emerged in October 1942. 
and the last one was manufactured in November 1945. Their first combat mission was not flown until August 1943. Yet of the 6,477 Japanese planes down by the U.S. Navy in the Pacific, well over 5,000, over 80%, met their fate at the hands of Grumman's remarkable fighter, the F-6F Hellcat. 